Good morning, everyone. Seems like Instagram is taking its time. It says checking connection. Ooh, I'll give it a self to check itself. I'll give it a second to check itself. Maybe I should cancel. Seems as if I have good internet, so let's try again. I want to thank you for being here with me today. Seems like we're here on, oh, there we go, there's Instagram. We're finally here on Instagram. Hope you're all having a fantastic day. I went out to do a party with Amy last night to support James's school. Didn't know private schools needed additional support, but um, apparently they do. And it was an 80 themes party. You can find pictures of us on Instagram. James hit me in my eye yesterday. As you can see, I have a red mark underneath my eye. So that's nice. Turns out as your children age, they get stronger. And um, must protect yourself at all times, as they say in boxing. So now I walk around like this whenever um, James is around me, because otherwise he might get me. Um, we did have a giveaway. Recently, let's go ahead and announce the winners. We actually had three winners of this most recent giveaway. Third place winner who receives six months of my training site, Poker Coaching Premium, is Brian Landon. Brian Landon, congrats. We will email you information. Second place winner who will receive 12 months of Poker Coaching Premium is Michael Strassener. Michael Strassener, congrats. And the winner of the grand prize of this most recent giveaway. They get 12 months of Poker Coaching Premium and $500 cash to go play whatever cash game they want is Harvey Hashimoto. So congrats to Harvey. So Brian, Michael, Harvey, we will be sending you an email with information on how to claim your prize. Congrats on that. Also, before we get started today, we're down to the final four of the Global Poker Index Poker Personality of the Year Award. Believe it or not, some people think I have an okay personality. And um, if I have helped you over the last year to improve your poker, improve your life, or just have a better time with your hobby, I would appreciate your vote. Uh, you can find a link directly to that at twitter.com slash Jonathan Little. It's the very first post on my Twitter page. So check that out. I would appreciate your vote if you think I'm a worthy candidate. And if I'm not, well, vote for someone else because I want the right person to win. Today, I don't have a ton of time because I'm going for a five-day-long party in New Orleans with one of my friends, my one of my best friends, Adam Geyer. You all may know him online as CSIM Sucks or Chuck Hong Rocks. He is having his bachelor party in New Orleans for five days with a bunch of people. Odds are one of us will probably pass away. Hopefully, you see me next week. I'll be back here on Friday, a week from today, for the next episode of A Little Coffee, but... We'll run replays on YouTube. Some of my favorite episodes, I've gone through and picked those. So, feel free to watch them. Same time, right? Today, we're gonna be discussing how to play when you are on an upswing. A lot of people like to talk about downswings, complain about downswings, etc. But, if you're good, you're actually gonna be on an upswing more often than not. So there are two main spots where I thought about this. The first is when you're actually playing at the table. And the second is like long-term, right? Like say you're winning five tournaments in a row, which does happen inevitably. So let's talk about at the table first. Let's say you're sitting there, you're playing, you're winning every hand, things are going great. First thing you wanna ask is like, why am I winning? Am I winning because I'm just getting hit by the deck? If you're just getting hit by the deck, unless your opponents are especially bad and superstitious, you should not really change anything because you only really see um, upswings or you know good streaks looking backwards right you may say oh my gosh i've ran one every hand for the last five hands that doesn't really matter at all from a math point of view it's completely irrelevant whether or not you have won hands recently that does not indicate whether you're going to win hands in the future based on your cards right now if you're winning because let's say your opponents are folding way too often or maybe because they are deathly afraid of you then sure, right? Keep raising and playing hands, but then you're raising exploitatively because you are taking advantage of something the opponents do incorrectly. Let's see. Have you ever had an extreme hit by the deck? You said, her well, getting hit by the deck means that's a good thing. That means you're winning all your hands. 
um, like a cold deck means you're not winning your hands. But anyway, anyway, slow down. Today we're talking about good things. We're not talking about when you're running poorly. I know a lot of you like to complain about running poorly. Today we're talking about how to handle yourself when you are running well. As Printline here says, best feeling ever, getting lucky and playing great and crushing the table. Yeah, sometimes it just happens. Now, there's this idea that when you are at the table and you're winning hands, you should do your best to continue playing more hands in the future. And I actually don't think that's such a bad idea. I don't think you want to go nuts on it with that with that concept. I don't think you want to go insane because if you get like the 9-4 offsuit, you're just going to lose money if you play it, right? But maybe you should widen your ranges just a little bit if your opponents will be a little bit more inclined to stay out of your way. And it turns out that when your opponents fold, even just a little bit too often, you get to play significantly more hands, often in an aggressive manner, right? So you are playing a wider range to take advantage of what they're doing incorrectly. But if your opponents play well and they're not superstitious and they don't care about the fact that you won the last five hands, they realize you're supposed to win five hands in a row every once in a while, well, then the fact that you have been running hot is completely irrelevant. And that is important to recognize. As you play against better and better and better opponents, the fact that you have been lucky recently does not matter. Doesn't matter, right? Because you don't know if you're going to get good cards in the future. But if your opponents are going to be nitty against you, you should be a little bit more aggressive. I remember reading in Super System a long time ago, Doyle wrote something to the effect of, if you won the previous hand, you should always play the next hand. And uh, I completely disagree. Uh, that logic may be worked in 1972 or whenever he wrote it, but it does not work today. And the very, very unprofitable hands against competent opponents are just going to definitively lose money. So don't enter the pot in spots where you are going to definitively lose money. If you missed one of my various promotions, um, we typically only keep those open while they're open, but you can send us an email, support at pokercoaching.com, and we will see what we can do. Where can you vote for me? Go to twitter.com slash Jonathan Little, and then the very first post on my Twitter page will be my uh, the link to vote for me for the Global Poker Index Poker Personality of the Year. We've been in the top four three years in a row. They've only done it three years, so that's good. I think Lex was in it last year. Besides that, it's been a rotating cast of characters because, well, it's hard to stay motivated and hard to continue on the grind over and over and over again. And I'll tell you all the secret. A lot of people like to think what they do is hard. I actually think what I do is kind of easy. I wake up and I talk to you all about poker and I help you improve. And that, that's, uh, you know, reward itself. But, you know, winning, winning uh, public awards is a great way to continue getting publicity, which will in turn allow me to help other people improve their skills. All right. Alice Cheryl said you should play pa that some people play passively on a downswing because their sub subconscious is telling them that their opponent always has it. Uh, yeah, I think that that is true, which is exactly what I was saying, right? Inevitably, if you are running well at the table, kind of in turn, everybody else is running a little bit poorly, and that may result in them playing a little bit too tight, which is exactly what I was saying, right? If they're going to play a little bit too tight because they expect you to have a good hand, then, or they just expect you to have it, whether or not it's actually a good hand or not, then um, that's that. Can you vote more than once? As far as I know, you can vote one time per device, or I guess per IP address, I don't really know. Um, okay. Next, what about when you're running well long term? Now, we've all had good big downswings, but every once in a while you're actually going to have big upswings. Now, it's very easy in tournaments to have mostly downswings just because you don't win tournaments all that often, right? Let's say, you know, you're playing a 100 person tournament and there are, you know, they pay 10 people, let's say. Yeah, I probably only get a lot of money whenever three people. Or the, I'm sorry, the top three people probably get money. I'm trying to read and talk at the same time. It doesn't work. Um, top three people get money. A lot of money. Well, how likely are you to get in the top three places? Even if you're very, very good, you're only going to be in the top three places one in, what, one in 20 times? So what are the odds that you go one in 20 and then one in 20 again? Right? It's not very good. It's one in 20 times 20, which is one in 400. So then what are the odds you're going to do one in 20 again? It's 20 times 400, which is what, 8,000? 8, so 1 in 8,000, you're going to go top 3, top 3, top 3. If you're good, just doesn't happen all that often, right? That said, 
Um, a few times in my career, I have had very good runs back to back. I remember in Biloxi one time, I won a tournament outright and then chopped the next one. Those were like 200 person tournaments. Um, another time, I took second places back to back to a notorious YouTuber, Alec, Alec Torelli. Alec Torelli beat me heads up twice. We actually got it both. We got it all in flipping. Back then, we were both backed by the same person. So the same person ended up scooping like, I don't even know, over half of the prize pool two times in a row. That's probably pretty sweet, right? Um, and then they made us like stand back to back on a cover of a magazine. Do I have it here? I don't think I do. I don't think I have it right here. Let's see. It'd be a relic of the past if I had it. We have various magazines that I've been on the cover of. We have um, Card Player Magazine. We have Card Player Magazine. Back in the day. We have um, the Ireland Poker Player. We have Golf, Golf, Golf Coast Poker Magazine. Anyway, there's one without Alec Torelli. I don't have it on, on, on hand. That's unfortunate. Beat me back to back. That was a long time ago. Did I announce the winners of the contest? Yes, I did already. Third place winner, Brian Landon. Second place winner, Michael Strancer. First place winner of $500 and six months of poker coaching premium is Harvey Hashimoto. John says we have both those card player magazines. Very cool. Okay, so when you are in an upswing, realize it doesn't matter. Again, you have to stay sane, right? Because, let's see, one second. Essentially, it doesn't matter what happened in the past, right? You may hear some people say that, oh, whenever he wins a tournament, he comes back and he's confident the next time. But I mean, like in reality, if you know math and understand math, recognize that it doesn't really matter what happened in the recent past, right? If you have an edge, you show up and you collect your return on investment. So if you collect your return on investment, then why are you so concerned about what happened most recently? As Elok here says, winner's tilt. Yeah, winner's tilt is a real thing. Now, the thing is, is that I think the idea of winner's tilt may actually result in a lot of people playing a little bit more confidently. And it's going to turn out that just being a little bit more confident, which also leads you to going for it a little bit more often with your bluffs or going for it a little bit more with your big folds that are perhaps good, is something that may make a lot of people actually play better because a lot of people don't really know what they're doing and if you just put them in scenarios and have them go for it a little bit more, they will inevitably perhaps have better results. Maybe they actually do play better compared to their baseline strategy, right? However, if you're a very good player, that does not mean you should all of a sudden start just bluffing way more often, right? Because you already are playing fundamentally sound. Now, maybe bluffing slightly more is ideal, but it's... You know, you should not drastically change your, change your strategy because of this. How do you explain sick upswings like what Alex Foxen has had? Well, every year, if you pay attention, someone runs incredibly hot. Two or three years ago, it was Fader Holtz. Year before, year, year after that was Justin Bonomo. Year after that now is Alex Foxen. And you have to realize that these players are all very, very world-class players, right? They are the best of the best. So when they do have an upswing, it's going... Well, first off, they're going to generally be on an upward trajectory, right? And so, if you do the math, ask how many times people played tournaments this year. Take a second to think about it. I just told you, one in 8,000, you're going to go top three, top three, top three in a 100-person tournament. I remember, these guys are often playing relatively small field events. Not always, but sometimes, right? So, what are the odds you go top three, top three, top three? If you're good, we already determined it's about one in 8,000, okay? How many periods of three tournaments do you think were played among high-stakes pros this year? Well... I didn't even play that much, and I played, uh, you know, they, the, the tournaments overlap, right? So it's basically how many tournaments does each people, each person play this year. If each good high-stake pro plays 100 tournaments each year, that means you need 80 pros on average-ish. This is very loose math. Don't don't quote me on this. On average, you need eight, 80 pros for someone to go three top threes in a row. Now... Obviously, uh, whenever you're talking about the super high roller tournaments like Fedor and Bonobo and a lot of them are playing, now they're only playing like 30-person fields with re-entries, right? So how do you explain these good runs? 
someone is going to run good. They actually interviewed Justin Bonomo after he won the million dollar one drop tournament, which is after he won the 300k and after he won a whole load of other stuff. And they said, what are you doing that's allowing you to win so hard? It's like, I'm winning all my flips. <laughs> and it's true, right? I mean, that's really it. Look back here. This trophy here, I won a 400 per 300 person tournament. And this trophy here, I won a 300 person tournament within like four or five WPTs of each other. And what was happening then that was different now? Well, people folded too much back then, so I had a nice edge. And I was just winning more than my fair share of flips, right? And I think a lot of people like or want to try to attribute success to some magic bullet. Because if they can bottle that magic bullet and figure it out for themselves, then all of a sudden you will start crushing it, right? But in reality, what it is, is someone or a few people is going to run hot every year. It's somebody, right? Just pay attention. And a lot, very often these people drop off a little bit over the next year or two. And it's not because they got worse. Quite often they get better, right? I'm immensely better at poker today than I was when I won those two trophies back then. Immensely better. Like, it's not even, it's lights and day difference. But, you know, there's variance in the game. Should you take a flip if you know it's a flip? Well, it depends on your pot odds, right? You give me two to one on a flip, I'll flip you for lots and lots of money. All right, what else do we have about these long-term downswings? Um, so realize you will inevitably, in cash games, go on long winning streaks. I mean, again, it depends on your edge, right? But if you do have an edge, you're going to go in the upper trajectory. And in cash games, it may almost become normal-ish for you to feel like you are on or should be on an upswing. And that leads some people to feel entitled, especially when they play small stakes games and they move up to where they have a smaller edge. They still feel that entitlement of having a 15 big blind per 100 win rate. And that's a problem. That gets a lot of people in trouble. They think they're always supposed to win, but in reality, you're not. You're going to have downswings. And when those downswings hit, people lose their minds. So you have to stay sane and realize the game that you signed up for and understand the game you signed up for, right? Let's see. Yves says, if your game is starting to get tighter and you know that you're folding too much, at what number of hands... Can you raise with anything? You should never raise with anything. You should be raising instead with blockers or good suited connected hands. Kevin Smith is here. Welcome, Kevin. Good morning. You're cursing autocorrect. Well, it's usually better than it is worse. Um, Kevin always likes to say, click like, click subscribe, share this with your friends. And I appreciate that too. So click like and click subscribe. What books are on your shelves? All those up there on this row, these are all books that I either made or had my hand in making. All these other books are books that I read and reference and like, that I need to reference every once in a while. Every once in a while, we uh, you know we pull stuff off the shelf and prove to you it's not a green screen, right? We had this card player magazine over there. We pulled it off the green screen and proved that it is actually real. Unbelievable. Does it look like a green screen to all of you back there? Yeah. Um, okay. So understand you're going to go on long losing streaks and winning streaks, right? It's very, 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 very important. So whenever you are on an upswing, enjoy it, right? That said, you have to ask how you want to approach the game. Some people get it in their minds that when they're winning, they need to move up. They need to start playing bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, that's okay. That's okay. But realize that if you are treating poker where you normally play, let's say, $1,000 tournaments and you win a tournament for 100 k if you start hopping in 10 k you're essentially just parlaying very, very hard. And when you do try to parlay anything, whether it be you know regular tournament buy-ins, cash game buy-ins, heads-up sit-and-goes, satellites, whatever, whenever you are trying to take a little bit of money and turn it into a load of money, that often fails. Now, every once in a while, you will succeed. This is where you see people like Alex Fox is a good example. I don't know anything about his bankroll management, so I'm not exactly quoting him. But I know three years ago, he was playing lots of $1,000 and $2,000 tournaments. And now he's playing 100Ks. How does that happen? Very often, the answer is very aggressive bankroll management or selling a lot of action. And there's nothing wrong with either one of them. Recognize, though, the potential consequences, right? Whereas um, if you take someone like uh, Justin Bonneau, who's been around a very long time, who's been playing the high stakes for forever, I bet he's probably played with better bankroll management than some of the players who like skyrocket up and then inevitably just disappear, right? Like Justin Bonham was not gonna disappear unless he just feels like disappearing. 
Whereas, um, well, you can look through the past, right? Who have been the, the very hot players. Some of them inevitably disappear. And it's because they were probably just running rather hot. Okay, talk about bad beats. Yeah, they don't matter. Play with a big bankroll. That's actually something I've written right here. Read jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll. Now, you have to ask how you want to approach this game that you are playing. Are you approaching it like a hobby? Are you approaching it like a degenerate gambling game? Are you approaching it like something that you want to do successfully long term, which is how I approach it, right? And you're going to find that if you want to have longevity, you want to keep a big bankroll. And you want to play in games that you can beat consistently, right? Now, yeah, it's tough whenever I'm talking to a generic public because I realize people want different things from poker, right? And when people want different things from poker, it's hard to give everyone exactly what they want. But if you want to play long term, my best advice for you is to give up a little bit of equity. Give up some equity because if you give up a little bit of equity in exchange for keeping a much bigger bankroll, you will inevitably never go broke. I have been at zero risk of going broke ever. And the one time I actually got kind of close, what did I do? Did I just keep playing? No, I moved down to the tiny stakes games and confirmed that I was a winning player and grinded up 100 buy-ins at every single buy-in level back the way up. And I think it's very important to ensure that you are a winner so that you're not just wasting your time because one of the worst things you can do in life is to do something you don't particularly love and spend your time doing it in a way that destroys your life. I mean, drugs are a good example of this, right? A lot of people don't want to be on hard drugs, yet they are on hard drugs. They cost them money, and it costs them time, and it costs them their health. Why are they on these things? It's because they are addicted. But if you could like, have them flip the switch and say, would you rather not be on this? The answer would be clearly yes. Now, poker's not like that for most people, but I don't want all of you spending years of your life kind of goofing off playing a game if you have no real potential in it and you don't actually like it, right? I mean, a lot of people get into poker because they like money, right? And they think, okay, poker's gonna be a way to get rich quick, but it's not. In reality, it's a great way to get rich slowly, and it's a horrible way to get rich quick. Now, there are some ways that you can, um, there, there are certain games that are better to turn X amount of money into a larger amount of money. Like, for example, I think sit and goes are great when you're trying to turn like $50 into a thousand. It's not so good to turn a thousand into a million, though. Uh, whereas, like, tournaments are, are a great way to turn a little bit or maybe a thousand or five thousand into a million over time. So anyway, we're getting we're getting off topic here. Essentially, understand that you can approach poker as you would like. If, like, the best advice I was ever given by my very first poker coach, a guy named Bill Seymour, was to take the win rate that you are observing over a long period of time and then cut it in half and presume that's your actual win rate. And if you do that, you will never go broke. It's kind of true, right? Like, let's say you are winning at 10 big blinds per 100 in cash games over a long sample. Well, if you really want to have no swings and you just want to have a nice, steady upswing, assume you're winning at five big blinds per hour and then spend as if you're winning at, like, three big blinds per hour. And then you're just going to have excess cash all the time, right? When I was playing cash games at Bellagio all day every day, I had more cash than I knew what to do with. And, you know, that that is going to give up potential income in exchange for ensuring you never go on any sort of big downswing and you just never go broke. And I think that's good for mindset for a lot of people. You feel like you better play, you, you play better on a small bankroll. How do you stay hungry? I realize my goal is to show up and play my best. How do you stay, it's, it's really questions, how do you stay motivated in life? Well, going back to the Global Poker Index, right? You see the top four of the poker personality every year. We've been in it every single year. And, um, you know, maybe that'll change in the future, maybe not, but I like what I do. So the question is, how do you like what you do? Well, do things that you like. If you don't like it, maybe it's not for you, right? Because like the idea of maybe a lot of people get into poker because they want to win money, but inevitably they win some money. They're like, oh, what am I doing now? And uh, that changes things. Let's see. One leak you're working on. That when you're down in a session, you are overly motivated to play, but when you're up, you don't have the same motivation, even if the game is good. Well, realize that every hour you sit at the table, you win your win rate for the most part. It doesn't exactly work like that, but pretend, assume it's like that, right? So if you sit, I mean, something I would always do, if I'm sitting there and playing and I don't really like playing, I'll just leave. 
right? Because say you are playing 2-5 no limit. You have to ask, would I sit here for another hour to make $50? If the answer is no, then pack it up and leave. And that's it. Where can you find the Faraz Jockey content? Currently, I think he has a quiz or two in the quiz section that should be right at the top. And he's going to have a class coming out relatively soon in mid-February. So we did announce that Faraz Jaka, one of the absolute best tournament poker players in the world, with over $10 million in cashes, is a new poker coaching coach. So recently we've hired Jonathan Jaffe, who is like, in my mind, the best exploitative poker player and an amazing poker coach. We've hired Faraz Jaka, who is also super exploitative. You have to realize, I am now making the training site that I want. Because look, I am not the best exploitative player in the world. I do not get in there and play every pot and battle with everybody. I play good fundamentally sound poker and adjust a little bit. These guys are in there really fighting hard and they have amazing results. And I'm crafting the side I want. I hired the best GTO expert, Michael Acevedo. He wrote the book, Modern Poker Theory. There it is right down there. What is this? This is my mat to stand on whenever I'm standing and making videos. We'll put that over there. Um, so we hired Michael Acevedo, the best GTO expert in poker, and we've hired, in my mind, the two best exploitative players in the world. So we are giving you very different views of poker that you can combine into one to make you a poker superstar. How do you change from online to live if your bankroll is small? Play small live or grow a bigger bankroll online. In my mind, you should get to the mid-stakes online before you try to move to live poker if money is an issue. Because at the mid-stakes online, you can actually make a decent amount of money per hour. And once you're doing that, you can take shots in the very soft live games of you know, comparable, comparable buy-ins. And you're just going to crush it. But take it slow. Take it slow. Is it wise to take a bank or a built-up in cash games and play tournaments with higher buy-ins? No. That'd be really, really bad. Would it be wise to take um, a bankroll built playing No Limit Hold'em cash games and go play Deuce to 7 Triple Draw? No, that'd be really dumb. But that's what a lot of people do. <laughs> Back in the day when uh, Pot Limit Omaha started becoming a game that people played, I remember a lot of No Limit Hold'em players would be like 5 to No Limit Hold'em players and then immediately go play 5 10 Pot Limit Omaha, and a lot of them went stone broke. Because... Even if they were good, there's a lot of variance in PLO. So you're going to have bigger swings. So if let's say you normally have 100 buy-in bankroll, you're feeling pretty good. Well, you're going to go on 100 buy-in downswings in PLO all the time. That's just normal, right? And they didn't get that, right? So they approached, they, they took their money that they wanted something else and put it into something else. And they are long gone. All right, all right, all right. Super happy about Faraz. Good. Motivations is what it feels like to be able to do what you want to do. If you aren't feeling motivated to play poker, then you might want to reflect and meditate on what else you can do. Yeah. I mean, that's really it. Like, if you're hating your situation or if you just don't want to be doing something, figure out why, right? Is Modern Poker Theory a good book for insert various stakes? Modern Poker Theory will teach you how to play fundamentally sound poker. It's very, 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 very important. He built up $150 from $8 playing small stakes, and it's all gone. Well, where, where did it go? Half through bad play, half through the worst hands winning. Well, such is life, right? Realize at 10 no limit, you only had 15 buy-ins. You're going to go on a 15 buy-in downswing, right? You did not read jonathanlowpoker.com slash bankroll, where very clearly there I tell you, keep 30 buy-ins or maybe even more. And if you're new to poker, definitely more. When is Amy going to be the, charity, the coach for charity poker tournaments? Amy's been crushing charity poker tournaments. She won one the other day. For the Ronald McDonald House, uh, the Will the Thrill put on. And um, she final tabled a big one that got her on the World Poker Tour for a second or two. So that's pretty cool. It's unreal what they will call down with, which is great. You want them calling down with garbage. So many people think, oh my God, my opponents call down with garbage. I can't beat them. But that's actually why you beat them. Keep a big bankroll and it doesn't matter. Do you remove a quiz from the site? I don't know. I don't think so. Maybe. <laughs> Send us an email, support at pokercoaching.com. If you ever see anything wrong with pokercoaching.com, if you have suggestions, send us emails. I read every single email that comes in to support at pokercoaching.com, and I want to see that. Is modern poker theory more focused on tournament play? No. It's focused on both. There's a section on tournament play and the adjustments you should make. You have to understand that 
poker theory and tournament play gets really convoluted quickly because there are various situations. There's actually a chapter coming out in my next book, Excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em Games by Vlada, a very, very good online player. And his section is on GTO as it pertains to the independent chip model. And um, it's neat stuff. So, I mean, I, I learned stuff. I mean, again, I'm, I'm making, you know, lower level content for past Jonathan Little that I would have liked as a newer poker player. But I'm also making super high level content that Jonathan Little today wants. And then I take that and give it to you at a tiny fraction of the cost that it cost me to make it. What's my perfect book for a beginner? You know, Mark, I don't actually have a book for a stone beginner. If you don't know what a deck of cards is, if you don't know that a straight beats three of a kind, I don't have a book for very, very beginning players. Um, but I would suggest strategies for beating small six poker tournaments or strategies for beating small six poker cash games. Glenn, if you have any suggestions like improve someone's microphone, send me an email, support at pokercoaching.com. I will buy them a microphone and mail it to them. Good. Anyway, telling me stuff when I'm doing the stream doesn't help me a ton because I'm doing the stream right now and I can't remember things like that. Which events will I be playing in the World Series? I don't know. I know I'm going to play the World Poker Tour at the uh, right before the World Poker Tour Tournament of Champions right before the main event or right before the World Series. Then I'm probably going to come back home because there's been a lot, just like a lot of medium-ish to small stuff in the middle of the World Series and I'll go back for the end. They usually have a 5K and a 10K and some stuff afterwards. How do you practice away from the table? Go through the poker coaching quizzes, right? We have loads and loads of quizzes. Go through the homework challenges. We have loads of those too. Hello from Russia. Good morning. All right. Well, as I told all of you, I have to go. I'm going to New Orleans in just a few hours. I have to go get some documents notarized for tax purposes. That's a lot of fun. So I have um, 32 minutes to put on my pants and then go to uh, go to the notary service and then scan in some documents, and then um, get on an airplane. So I'm going to be gone until Wednesday. Next, A Little Coffee Live will be on Friday, but you can catch reruns on youtube.com slash poker coaching on Monday and Wednesday at 9 a.m. Eastern time. Have fun in Louisiana. Be safe. Yeah, um, people get lost in the bayou. Luckily, I know how to swim, so I'll be okay. If... Uh, <laughs> Apparently, you all think I'm not actually wearing pants. Believe it or not, I am. No, I'm not. Who, who am I kidding? We have no pants on. Remember that time Negreanu uh, was streaming on Twitch and he was like streaming in his bed or something and then showed that he had no underwear on? That's a lot of fun. Or maybe he went to pee or something. People do funny things on stream. Um, so yeah, like uh, if you forgot already, uh, or if you did not already, head over to twitter.com slash Jonathan Little and vote for me for the GPI Poker Personality of the Year Award. Today is the last day to vote. If I have helped you improve your poker skills over the last year, I would appreciate it. And it's not just for me. It's for all the people out there like you who perhaps don't know me yet, who want to improve their skills, but they don't know where to go. And getting in front of those people and... Becoming you know, known to them will go a long way to helping them improve their poker and enjoy this game that we all love more. So help me help them do that. As uh, Kevin always says, click like, click subscribe, as I always say. Hope you have a great day. Hope life treats you amazingly well. Is today Friday? I think it's today Friday. I never know what day it is. It is Friday. Have a great weekend. Good luck. Have fun. Be nice to someone. And I'll talk to you next time.